Welcome to the Mini Dairy Goat Podcast, all things miniature dairy goat. Not too big, not too small, just right. I'm your host, Carrie O'Neill. Join me as I guide you through the enchanting and addicting world of miniature dairy goats. Okay. All right. All right. Hey, goat friends. Welcome to the Mini Dairy Goat Podcast. We're here with our second uh, partnership with the Texas Mini Milkers with their education series. So just want to welcome everyone. This is a live webinar that we are looking at slides here. So for the podcast, there might be some visuals you might miss out on, but we'll hopefully get you some good education there when you listen to this on the podcast and definitely want to welcome all of our attendees here tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Top, who is the education chair of the Texas Mini Milkers. Uh, over to you, Michelle. Okay. Thanks, Carrie. Hi, everyone. So this, like she said, this is the second um, series in the education classes that I'm putting together. We were supposed to have um, Catherine Draval from Fur Meadow uh, Herbal uh, with us, but due to a family emergency, she was unable to be here tonight. So we are rescheduling with her to do an herbal class later. Um met with Sandy uh, Monday and guys are gonna, this is a great presentation. I'm really excited that she w agreed to do this for us. So Sandy, thank you very much. And let's get us started. Okay. Um, well, I'm Sandy Walters and um, I own and manage uh, Meadow Mist Lab Service here in Southern Michigan. And we do small ruminant parasitology. Mostly we do goats, but we also do some sheep, alpacas, and llamas. And I want to thank the Texas Mini Milkers uh, for um, asking me to do this presentation. I really appreciate it. And it's been kind of fun to put it together. So I hope that we have some things here that will... Um, enlighten you and it's something that I have a, a big passion for so um, I really appreciate you uh, tuning in and we'll get started so for our learning objection objectives. Uh, we are going to start out, we're going to discuss the importance of parasite management in miniature goat, dairy goat breeds or any miniature goat breed. And what's the difference between a miniature goat and a standard goat? Why is it so much more important for miniature goat breeders? So we're going to cover that. Uh, tonight's Discussion, I'm going to focus exclusively on gastrointestinal parasites. You know, we have other uh, parasites that we struggle with, such as lungworms and um, liver flukes and things like that. But uh, for the most part, the difference between a standard and a miniature goat is going to come in to play with your gastrointestinal parasites. So that's what we're gonna focus on tonight. Uh, I'm going to discuss the types of common worms that we see with regard to uh, um, what they actually do to the gut and how they impact the goat. And with them, we're gonna discuss some treatment options uh, some do's and some don'ts. Hopefully there's going to be a little bit of information that might be new to you for you to think about. And then finally, we're going to look at some risk management strategies that are out there. Uh, they're kind of interesting and they may be some things that you might want to employ. So, why is parasite management more important for miniature goats? Well, here's the problem. Uh, your blood volume is 6 to 8% of your body mass. 
So if you've got a standard size dough, which weighs about 154 pounds, she's going to have a blood volume of 4.9 quarts, which is a little over a gallon. Whereas our Nigerian dough here, she weighs 77 pounds. She's got a blood volume of 2.5 quarts as opposed to 4.9 quarts. So she has 0 0.6 gallons of blood. So that is why it is so much more important for a miniature goat because they just simply cannot afford to lose as much blood as a larger goat can. Um, it's really easy to see how quickly that goats can become anemic. Um, the uh, in actual parasite load of a thousand fiber pole worms is going to take about 50 mils of blood a day. So that is a really significant amount. Uh, your formatcha is your most important. It should be the backbone of your uh, parasite management. It's easy. It's free. It's effective. You just need to learn to do it and employ it because it's going to make your herd management practices so much more effective. Um, here I've put some pictures of some uh, of the adult versions of the worms. Um, here at our lab, we are looking at eggs, but I uh, thought you might be interested in seeing what some of these uh, worms look like as adults. Um, the one that's in the middle, the hookworm, you can see it's got pretty nasty looking little mouth on there. And uh, they actually, they do... Uh, uh, feast on blood also, so they're one of the ones that can cause a lot of problems. So we'll talk about uh, Hamacus, which is barber pole. Everyone knows barber pole is the most dreaded worm. And so I wanted to let you know on some things, some facts about them that you might not know. I think you probably do know that they feed on blood. They cause anemia and mortality. One adult worm is going to consume like 50, 30 to 50 microliters of blood a day. So as I mentioned, and there's a picture down below, a 50 cc, a 50 mil syringe, which you may have used before for drenching, so you know how big that is. When a thousand barber pole worms is, are going to consume that much blood every single day. Um, and one of the problems that makes barber pole hard to get rid of is that the fact that they're very prolific egg producers. They can produce, each worm can produce up to 10,000 eggs per day. I'm glad I wasn't the researcher that had to sit there and count all those eggs uh, and <laughs> to find that out. But, um, I mean, that, that seems mind-blowing. It, it doesn't even seem possible that anything could uh, produce that many eggs. So that's why they're so difficult to eradicate. Uh, in goat breeders in the south, I'm in Michigan, so we usually get pretty good freezes here, which does help to get, kill some of the parasites in the pasture. I don't think that you have that luxury there. Um, I know we have a lot of clients in Florida, and they have a, a terrible time there with barber pole. Um, they just don't get a break at all. Uh, and then um, Resistance to anthelmintics is very common with barber pole. I will talk about anthelmintics throughout the talk, but that is just a fancy word for dewormer. And if you hear people say wormer, correct them because you're not worming, you're not giving your goat worms, you're deworming it. So that's one of the things that is uh, kind of a common mistake. Um, 
So here's something that you might not know. Uh, Barbara Paul is going to cause anemia. It's going to cause lethargy. Uh, but it does not. Studies have shown that it does not cause diarrhea. So a lot of people think diarrhea, oh, we've got barber pole. Uh, and the studies have shown that that is not actually one of the symptoms of barber pole infection. So what would cause diarrhea? Well, uh, trichostrongylus, which is commonly called bankrupt worm, uh, those do cause diarrhea. Those are a worm that we see very frequently. Um, usually most goats have some of both. Uh, and the bankrupt worms do cause uh, diarrhea, uh, loss of condition, unthriftiness. And um, the uh, worms feed in the mucosa in the gut. And they can cause some blood loss. But basically, they just interfere with the absorption, and they are um, they're really causing um, a lot of inflammation is the word I'm looking for. And uh, so you're going to if you see a lot of diarrhea, uh, this is could be one of the causes. Now the other thing that we need to know and think about with bankrupt worms is uh, they are not prolific egg producers like your barber pole. So currently the recommended uh, threshold is to deworm at egg, fecal egg counts of greater than 500 eggs per gram. And, but uh, at our lab, anyway, we do differentiate between bankrupt and barber pole. And uh, the reason why is because if you have about 300 eggs and they're mostly bankrupt worms, you've got a lot more worms than you would if they were all barber pole worms, if that makes sense. So I have actually had a doe in my herd that got a severe bottle jaw and her fecal egg count was only about 200, but it was mostly bankrupt worms. So I dewormed her and, you know, she returned back to normal. Uh, so that's where you have to sort of use common sense and know that you know, if you have uh, bankrupt worms, you really need to watch your famacha and, and see how the animal's doing, see how the famacha looks, along with your fecal egg count. And uh, um, if, uh, if the goat is not doing very well, then you probably would want to treat it even though it had a fecal egg count of less than 500 eggs per gram. Normally, I don't recommend that, but there are cases when you do, and that will be one of them. So, and the bankrupt, bankrupt worms are treated with the same exact anthelmintic that you would use for barber pole. Uh, bonostomum is what we call hookworm. Uh, it's different than the hookworm that people get, um, but they do go through, they can penetrate through the foot or the um, the brisket, any, any area that is in contact with the dirt, and they can also uh, get them by eating, you know, grass that is infected with a larva. So this is one thing to know is that uh, if you've got a stubborn case of um, hoof rot that you just can't get to, to clear up, that, that's a clue that you might have some uh, hookworm problems. Also, the hookworms migrate through the body when they, after they go up through the feet. They end up going to the lungs for a par, uh, part of their development period. And then the next stage is they get coughed up and swallowed. And then they become uh, to their next stage in the intestines. So if you see coughing, 
kind of like you would see, you would expect to see with a lungworm, where they're not sick, but they're just, you know, coughing fairly frequently. Uh, it might be hookworm rather than lungworm. There are tests that you can do easily to differentiate the two, but they can possibly cause some scarring in the lungs. And uh, so it's just you would want to take care of. Now, hookworms do feed on blood. We said uh, Barbara Pohl does, and bankrupt worms do not specifically feed on blood, um, but hookworms do. And uh, they also are not prolific egg layers, and so they're not quite as easy to detect. The eggs are quite large. Um, they're significantly larger than uh, Trichostrongylus or um, Camacus. So uh, we do see those fairly frequently. Um, Ostertagia is the brown stomach worm, and they live in Avomasum just like uh, Barber Pole does. It's uh, extremely difficult to differentiate the eggs of the brown stomach worm and the barber pole. I could do it when I was working in research because I had a billion dollar microscope. I don't anymore. Um, so we don't try to differentiate them, but we can get a clue uh, partly because the uh, brown stomach worms do cause diarrhea. Um, here again, they cause damage to the lining of the stomach. They can cause some bleeding. So um, you know, contribute to anemia, but they're not prolific egg layers. They only produce maybe, maybe 50 eggs a day. And so if you got a low egg count, but you got diarrhea, um, we might think, well, maybe that's what we're dealing with. So that, that gives us, can give us a little bit of a clue. Uh, Nematodirus, a uh, thin necked worm, they are worms that live in um, the large intestine and they consume the intestinal lining. These are a uh, worm that we see a lot in sheep um, and they can actually kill lambs before we can even detect them in a fecal. So, uh, but their hallmark system, symptom is diarrhea. Um, and, you know, the cause of death is um, dehydration in those cases. Um, and although they are, you know, most commonly seen in sheep, our sheep actually do develop an immunity to them, and goats do not. So that's a, a little bit different scenario than we see in most of the worms. Um, we do see these fairly frequently. They're kind of interesting eggs to see because they, I call them Goodyear blimps. They're huge, and they've got these beautiful spores in there. And, they're kind of pretty um, until they larvate, and then they're kind of horrendous. But anyway, uh, we typically don't see high numbers of those. And so if you're getting upwards of 20 eggs per gram on those, you would want to treat. Um, so Manesia is the tapeworm uh, in sheep and goats. And uh, we often see, you know, the tapeworm segments are on the feces. They're gross. They're disgusting. Everyone hates them. But the tapeworms actually really don't do much damage to the goat. Unless they have a huge number, they can cause a mechanical blockage in the intestines. But otherwise, they're somewhat self-limiting. They live uh, 12 to 18 months, and then they die. Um, the They come from... Um, a secondary host, which is a um, earth mite. So the goat eats the earth mite uh, when they're grazing, and then they can develop the tapeworms. Um, the only current option that's um, approved is valbazin um, to treat them. And uh, you would not ever use valbazin on a pregnant animal. Uh, that can cause abortion. Uh, Trichorous whipworm is one that we see fairly often. Usually when we see those, 
we're seeing some other things that are pointing to the fact that this goat's having some problems. Maybe um, immune system is down. Maybe they've been stressed. Uh, the hoofworms actually do consume blood. Normally, we might only see one or two eggs, and um, you know that's that's not too much to worry about. But lately, I've been seeing some that had like 35 or so. And I think well, something's going on with this animal. Um, and the uh, the compromise to the immune system is letting these whipworms kind of take over. Uh, most of the time you don't have to treat for them, but they are something to be aware of, especially for the fact that they do consume blood. Um, tax, uh, oh, Cooperia is a species of worm that lives in the small intestine um, and it damages severely the intestinal lining. Um, a lot of times if we have diarrhea and can't figure out what's going on, sometimes we can find the cuperia and we can figure out, okay, that's where your diarrhea is coming from. The gut is very inflamed and... Um, uh, you're not going to be able to absorb your nutrients and such. Um, you can treat for those. I kind of don't think you have too much trouble with those in Texas. They're more commonly seen in cooler areas. Uh, but Emeria or Coxidia, we all have that. And uh, they're single cell protozoans. Um, I think you could probably blast them with a a blowtorch and it wouldn't really do much to hurt them and um, the young animals are most susceptible to coccidia um, and so that's why we have to really keep up our coccidia maintenance program on our young animals because um, otherwise they end up stunted I know people, some people that actually raise Nigerians, which they call micro Nigerians, which are actually stunted from coccidia. And I, I can't really imagine that that is a very um, ethical thing to do. So it's not something that we would really want to do. Um, so we usually think, okay, we see a kid that's got diarrhea, we think of coccidia. However, be aware that goats can kids can have perfectly normal stool and still have a heavy load of coccidia. So um, uh, if they just because they don't have diarrhea, don't assume that they don't have coccidia because I have seen mm, quite a few goats die that actually didn't even ever get diarrhea. Um, and uh, so that's something to be be aware of. Um, now, what happens with goats when they get to be, oh, six to ten months old, they start getting an immune response. It's not the same thing as a true immunity, but an immune response to coccidia. Um, in order for that to happen, there has to be some coccidia present. So a lot of times... Um, you know, if they've got some coccidia, it might be at, even at a significant level, but it's not heavy. It's sometimes better just to not treat them because so you don't interrupt that natural process that's going on. But it depends on the animal. You've got to see how they're growing, how they're doing, and that type of thing. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then what can happen later, uh, is that if the animal gets stressed, that causes a blip in their immune system. And then at that point, coccidia can come in and uh, uh, start um, proliferating because of that. Uh, oh, well, the immune system and the immune response the kind of the safety net has gone down. I, I actually have a doe right now that kitted and had to have a C-section. And I'm going to have to treat her because she's got a lot of coccidia. Um, 
normally a normal adult you wouldn't see that but just so be aware that it can happen um, and usually it's stress associated okay so this I cannot stress enough the the purpose of your parasite management is not to eradicate every worm it just really isn't in most cases it really isn't possible and that isn't our goal our goal is to keep the goats above a threshold where their health is not being adversely impacted by the worm burden that they have um, so I'm going to use myself as an example because about 10 years ago, we had some problems with lungworms, and the vet had me get some Cydectin oral sheet drench to treat, excuse me, the, um, the lungworms. And I was doing fecals, of course. This was before I started the lab, but, and, uh, I saw, well, my goat had 30 eggs, so, well, I found out this Cydectin really works really great. And so I kept using it. And I didn't know at that point in time that you should not treat for low numbers like that. Um, and now the problem is that uh, the worms on my property are immune to have built a resistance to Cydectin, which is Moxidectin. And so, you know, I... I uh, have to say that you know I did the wrong thing and that's why I tried to educate people so you don't have the same problem that I had um, and there are other ways of um, controlling worms which we're going to talk about later so it's it's kind of a, a total package a total program that you're going to put together for your own specific farm uh, this is really, really true. We see this all the time in the lab. I see it in my own goats. I can tell you which goats are my 20%. In a given herd, uh, about 20% of the goats are going to carry 80% of the parasite burden. And um, so um, that's why we do what we call targeted treatment. And those are the animals that you're going to want to target because you are going to want to eliminate them shedding. Also, you want to, them to stay alive. But some of your other goats that have lower numbers, their Fumacha looks good, they're doing fine, you wouldn't want to treat them. Um, and what they call that, the worms that are in those goats that you don't treat is called refugia. And that's one of the ways of preventing um, resistance from building up. Because you didn't deworm those goats, those worms that are in those goats did not get subjected to the chemicals. And so they're not going to be developing resistance. That's why it's um, the best management practice not to deworm all of your goats at the same time or just go through and just deworm everybody uh you're really kind of shooting yourself in the foot i know it's very tempting to do that sometimes but um it's just something to be aware of uh doing fecal testing is a great um part of your program you might be able to do it yourself you might have that do it you might have a lab do it you can you know you can learn to do it yourself, um, and if you want to learn to do it yourself, the um, advice I give to people, the hard part is learning where to focus your microscope, because if you are looking through the microscope, you have to pretend like you're looking down onto uh, into a pond, and there's lots of layers in a pond. You know, where where am I going to look in the pond? Well, where you want to look, 
you want to look for the lily pads. Okay, so you want to look at the top layer. And how to find that is you're going to find thick black circles. Those are air bubbles. If you focus, if you can find the air bubbles and focus on them, then you're going to be able to see your eggs and your coccidia. That's the level that you want to be at. So that's a good thing to practice. There's different methods of running fecal samples. Um, there's plenty of information out there how to do it. And uh, sometimes it's a, it's a good thing. It's a good tool to have if, you know, if you can do it. And, um, but if not, it's really a good idea to try to identify which of the goats in your herd are your heavy parasite carriers um, and focus on them. Um, and if you can keep their burden down, then they're not going to be shedding thousands and thousands and thousands of eggs, in which case everybody's going to get worms. So that is um, fecal testing. The other thing that you can do from fecal testing, I feel this is really important. You need to deworm your goat. You find this out. So you deworm your goat. Now what? Do we assume, okay, goat's dewormed, everything's fine? Well, uh, not really. You need to find out if there, if there is efficacy in the treatment that you use. And so you can test another fecal sample in seven to ten days and see what kind of knockdown you get. Well, 90% of the worms are gone, then the product that you use is effective and it's great. And that's what you want. If you don't show any knockdown at all, then you know that you've got a resistance problem to, uh, with that particular product that you use. And that's how you find out. If you don't test, you're not going to know. Um, this is uh, something that's really, I'm really passionate about trying to teach people. Um, your farm over here is not the same as your neighbor's farm. The parasites on your farm could be entirely different than your neighbor's farm, unless you both have the same, goes from the same herd. But if you have a closed herd, then you're you're going to have your own unique ecosystem, and what works on your farm might not work on your friend's farm, or what works at your friend's farm might not work at your farm. I know that my worms are resistant to moxidectin. When I sell goats, I make darn sure that uh, they're as clean as possible because I don't want them shedding eggs at the new owner's place and giving a uh, resistance at the new owner's place. So that's why it is a good idea to quarantine your new goats and do some testing on them. And if they, you know, if they need to be dewormed, then you can figure out if they do have a resistance problem. If they have one and you don't, you know, then you're going to want to, make sure to get them as clean as possible before you do introduce them into your herd. Um, this is my pet peeve. If you go on Facebook, they're going to tell you, you got to use this. You got to use that. You got to use two of these. You got to use three of these. You, there's no way of knowing. Uh, people always ask me, what should I use? And the right answer is, it depends. It depends. It just depends. Fembendazole works great for some people. It doesn't work at all for other people. Um, so it's really, if you can find out what works on your farm and stick with that, then you have got a really good grip on your parasite management system.
Uh, I'm going to talk about Pomacha testing again because it is so important. People ask me questions all the time. The first question I ask them is, what's your goat's Pomacha look like? Uh, it's, it's really great to check the herd once a month if they're on the milk stand. You know, peek it dry once a month. Um, it's, it doesn't take much time. It saves life. Uh, training's available online, and I believe that uh, your group is going to start providing training for it, too. So that's a really nice um, thing to have. Uh, I wish we had that something like that here, but we don't. Okay. Dewormers, what one should I use? Well, we already talked about that. I can't tell you what one to use. But this is something that has come to light. Um, and I used to work at uh, Upjohn slash Pharmacia slash Pfizer Animal Health. It's now Zawetis Animal Health. And I worked some in the parasitology department. And I still keep tabs with them because I like to hear what's coming up the pike or, you know, what kind of new theories there are. Um, and back in the old days, if you had horses like I did, they said, you got to rotate your dewormers. Okay. Well, now the philosophy is don't rotate your dewormers. And, uh, the um, head uh, lead at of parasitology at Zoetis, has told me that from their research, they have discovered that if you don't use a product whatsoever for about three years, then the worms will lose their uh, resistance to it. And uh, so that's a, that's why you shouldn't rotate because eventually what you are using they're going to get resistant to it. And then there's not very many things available. So if you don't use something for three years or four years, you'll be able to go back to it. Um, and that's good because there really isn't much coming up the pipe right now. Um, and okay. As parasite resistance builds, it is often necessary to use two different classes of dewormers. Um, I wouldn't do that if I didn't, if you didn't know that you needed to, but you might have to. Um, for a while I had to use Cydectin, oral sheep drench and valbazin together. And that worked for a while. And then it didn't. So then I had to use it together two days in a row and that worked for a while and then it didn't so you know because I can look and watch and see what's going on I can figure this out um, and you should be able to too uh, by whatever means you know that you can I would urge you to figure out what is working for you and uh, and stick with it Did we have any questions at this point? No one's asked any questions yet, but I do have a question. I do. So, um, and I agree with you, um, like those, you know, those pages, uh, they just, I don't know. It's like they hit a panic button. Yeah. But um, yeah. So I don't, I read, I've always read the comments and stuff. I usually just walk away from it. Um, but one of the things that I was, you know, that I've heard over and over is when you do that dual class of dewormers, you do a white one and a clear one. Is yep. that because they're different classes? Um, in most cases they are, yeah. Okay. Um. um and then the other question I had was the back to the sheep thing, that worm that sheep carry. And you said mm -hmm. sheep don't often show signs of having that parasite, but it's very, um, goats get it really quick, I think is what you said. So, they do. Yeah. And I, it's one of the things that even here, it overwinters. I mean, those eggs can live forever. 
Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, There's a yeah. lot of farms around me that have sheep and they have sheep and goats. Yeah. And yeah, one of my neighbors lost all their sheep, sheep oh. and all their goats. Um, okay. So someone asked a lung, lungworm question. They said, my doe was diagnosed with lungworm two months ago by you. And they have an injection, ivermectin, and the cough went away for a while, but it's back with multiple goats coughing now. Okay. Uh, could that be allergies? Like, it's like getting spring and dusty. Could that, like, be part of it? Or should she it could be. have? Okay, it could be. No, she says no allergies. Um, you need to do more testing. I mean, I do a Behrman test you know, to look for lungworms. I'd also do a, um, a fecal count to look for hookworms. Okay. Because it could, it could be that too. Okay. Um, let me see. Who is this? Excuse me. All right. I'm going to see who this is so I can unmute them. So it's, it's Michelle Melville. Michelle, can you unmute yourself? Hi there. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. So uh, my question is, um, I had sent in a sample um, and then you had diagnosed her with lungworm. Um, I had another goat sample that I sent in and he was a buck and he had some coccidia and I didn't diagnose, I didn't treat for that. Um, now, when I had gave the injection for um, the ivermectin, um, it went away probably for about two weeks and then it slowly started coming back again. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there's a mentor, um, that I will, that I work with and she had suggested that I redose the ivermectin is a uh, goat life. Good life is who, who I use as my mentor. Um, she had suggested that I go ahead and do another injection of ivermectin, which is what I did. And then it went away for a couple weeks and then it came back again. And um, so then I stopped doing it altogether because she is pregnant. And so I didn't yeah. want to do anything right. else to hurt the fetus. Um, and then she had told me at one point to go ahead and do the rotation between ivermectin and val valbazin, I think is what it's called. Valbazin. Um, yes, thank okay. you, valbazin. She, wait, wait, Michelle, she told you to give that goat valbazin while it was pregnant? No, after, okay. after the pregnancy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 after the pregnancy. Um, and so now we've just kind of been hanging tight um I'm so concerned now because I feel like I've overdosed her with ivermectin and I'm worried that she's become resistant and then second there was one point where all my goats had started coughing so um my mentor just said to go ahead and treat everybody with ivermectin because she said it can be passed um through the cough no okay. so I did that so that's, uh, Michelle, not, yeah. yeah, but Michelle, something like this, you probably would want to go talk to your vet because that's not, I mean, Sa Sandy does pickles, so we can't really give advice for the protocol of what dewormers to use. I think I'm going to send another, I'm sending another sample, a couple samples back over to Sandy because I need to see whether or not they have it. Yeah. Um, you know, with whether or not everybody's been yeah. passed, but I did, I did contact my vet to see if we could do a couple lungworm tests and, and in my area, they don't do that. And so that's why I'm going to send it back to you to see if, if I'm still battling this, but yeah, I just, I'm, I'm kind of, so for the Cydectin, um, is that something better to use other yes. than the Ivermectin? Uh, I wouldn't say better, but I, I, I don't believe that Valbazin is, um, considered effective for lungworms so uh um michelle do you have the chart that um i can actually if you would message me your email address i have um a chart from one of the universities that um will explain each one of those and which families which classes to use together and why okay okay, okay. Right. i'm gonna go ahead and I'll mute myself again, and then I'm going to go ahead and send you my email address. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to say one one quick thing about lungworms, even though that's not what we're talking about. But lungworms are are 
Um, they have a secondary host, which is a slug or a snail. A goat cannot give lungworms to another goat. They have to eat the stuff that the snail or the slug leaves behind in the feed bunk or whatever. That's how they get infected with it. And then they cannot give it to another goat. It has to go back through the secondary host. And uh, that that uh, is a uh, very uh, positive. Um, I know that's how it is. So, Okay. Um, looking at some alternative treatments besides of the chemicals that we just looked at, uh, there is some quite a bit of information and research being done on copper wire particles uh, or copper boluses. And I found this out before I even read about it. I dosed my goats with copper. I have a copper problem here. Um, the water, my water has a lot of iron and molybdenum in it, so it inhibits copper absorption. So I use copper bowls. Excuse me. And um, I bowls my dose. Then I repeated a fecal sample. I'm like, where'd the worms go? Well, it really does work. Um, however, you do have to, you know, you don't want to overdose your, your dose on copper. So you kind of have to know your specific situation. You can get, um, you can order little capsules and you can make like one gram boluses uh, yourself if you want to do smaller doses. Um, I personally would never give more than two grams. Um, and I find that I can give two grams three times a year. So I, do that strategically, like I'll do it before I turn them out in pasture um, so that they're not shedding eggs. And then I'll do it again in the fall but before breeding. And um, usually I do it um, after they kid. So, but it doesn't mean that it's going to work on your farm. You have to kind of know your situation. Um, I don't want to say, hey, everybody go give copper to their goats because. Um, they, the research that I read on this says that they really don't absorb much of the copper from that. But if they don't, then why do we give it? So I, I'm a little bit fuzzy on that. So it, just be aware of that it's something that does really work well for killing barber pole. But, um, you know, with the caveat that you need to be careful and you need to know your situation um, and use the smallest dose that you can. Um, I don't ever dose kids with copper. I don't dose them until they're a year old. That's just me personally. Um, but uh, I could probably make smaller boluses, but I just don't. So Now, um, your herbal-based antimentics. Um, I think... Uh, for Meadow, the lady from For Meadow was going to give you a talk, maybe. Um, I can tell you because we have clients that use them, and I can tell you that they do work when people um, adhere to the system. And it is a system, it's a management system. Uh, I know Michelle uses it, and she's talked about the different ways that she puts the things together so that the animals eat them. Um, and uh, sometimes we get customer where we've got a little bit of a problem going on and, you know, maybe they'll have me talk to the, um, oh, uh, Chris Miller, who has land of Havala. Uh, sometimes we talk about a certain situation if the client asks us to. So, I will say that they do work, um, but it's not like once and done. Um, I know. So it depends on your situation, how much time you have, how much you like to monkey with it. Um, but um, it's, it's definitely a viable alternative.
Um, okay, so just kind of to recap, you want to um, do fecal testing to Andy, did we lose right. you? Pardon? I think we lost you there for a minute. Oh, sorry. I'll sit up straighter. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So in general, this is why I say, and that's why your parasite management program, I kept going to say it over and over and over again, it's flexible, it's personal, it's unique. But in general, you don't need to deworm for counts that are less than 500 eggs per gram. But if they're having a lot of diarrhea, you know, and you've got some bankrupt worms in there, that, you know, there can be exceptions to that. But if it's mainly barbapol, you don't need to. Um, and then if you retest in seven to 10 days, Uh, we lost you at if if you retest at seven to ten days. We lost you there. Well, it isn't effective. Um, once you figure out what works on your farm, stay with it. It's great. And then I already mentioned in three years, uh, around three years, um, the dewormer that's had an associated resistance. Uh, Sandy, we keep losing your audio. Um, if you did meat goats too. Um, so meat and milk withdrawal. Uh, I worked in an industry where we had a lot of beef cattle that we had to send to market. We had to, you know, be fanatical about making sure that their withdrawal periods had been met before they got sent to market. Um, so that's why I'm bringing this up, because uh, sometimes it's not really something that you think of off the top of your head. Um, so you want to make sure that you don't use an animal for meat before withdrawal time is complete. There are some uh, pretty good withdrawal times, meat and milk withdrawal times. I think University of Georgia has a nice one that's out there. Um, or you, you especially check with your veterinarian if you're unsure. Um, but, you know, avoid your milk. Withdrawal period is complete. And as far as kids nursing, um, that's not generally an issue. It's more of hu human. So, okay. Um, well, here's a... The quandary, what anthelmintics are actually labeled for goats? You've got Safeguard, which is fenbendazole, and Valbazin, which is albendazole. Those are both the same class. Um, and then we have rheumatol or morantol tartrate, which is a, a feed additive. It's a class three feed additive. Um, it can be put in big batches of feed. There are some pellets that are out there. I'm going to be quite honest with you. I'm not real familiar with that one. Um, I don't know about the efficacy of it. Um, just from looking into this um, presentation, it made me want to learn more about it. So I'll throw it out there for you to see if you want to look into it too. And uh, I mentioned Facebook, you know, there's... Sandy, we you're we you cut out. Can you repeat that, please? Yes. So, if you want to find out some information and not just uh, someone talking over the back fence or on Facebook or whatever, uh, Worm X W O R W O R M X. If you Google that, 
that gives you the um, Maryland group, the animal uh, small ruminant consortium um, for parasites. And they've got so many great articles there. And uh, so, you know, you're going to be best off instead of, you know, if you go to Facebook, you're going to get 50 different opinions and who's right, who's wrong. I don't know. And they all get mad. Um, just try to find a science-based fact article or uh, check with your, talk to your veterinarian. Um, so uh, now these other wormers that we uh, commonly use, yeah, I'll say do commonly use them. Ivermectin is not approved for goats. Dectamax, Cydectin, Levamisole, um, they are uh, allowed to be used extra label, so we are supposed to have a veterinarian's approval, and um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, now, so you want to use a coccidia stat for your kid who's got coccidia. Well, there aren't any coccidia stats that are approved for goats. Um, Can you repeat that, Sandy? We lost your, your audio again. Yeah, I can't see you anymore. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, let me go back. Um, so there aren't any coccidia stats that are approved uh, for use in goats. Um, which is crazy because goats get taxed. What are we supposed to do? Um, so everything that's available, your alpha, albine, your sulfa dimethoxine, chorid, um, everything that we, all the tools that we have to use are extra label and require veterinary per permission. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Just that's the way it is. Um, there is no money in it for big pharma. And if there's no money in it for big pharma, they don't pursue it. That's the way it is. Baycots or Tultrazural is not licensed in the U.S. Um, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. And okay. with Tultrazural, I know that I know a lot of people that purchase it. And if you do purchase it, it comes from Mexico. Um, it comes from lots of places, actually. Yeah. So Baycox itself is manufactured by Bayer, but not in this country. Um, and uh, but there are some that are are um, manufactured in somebody's backyard. And oh, that's all I'll say about that. Um, but. The thing about Baycox is that it's one dose as opposed to everything else is uh, five days in a row. Um, but it's not licensed. And uh, we do have coccidia preventatives. Um, Rumensin and Decox are labeled for use in goats. Decox, to me, I don't see that it is very effective anymore. Rumensin is... Uh, Highly, highly poisonous horses. If I had horses on my property, I wouldn't have rumensin. I think a teaspoon of rumensin would kill a horse. So that's not one to, um, that's one that you have to be really careful of. There is another, um, prevent. Candy, we lost your audio again. Instead of treating them for it, they have it all the time, and, and then they just don't get coccidia. Um, so that's an option. It's not licensed, but it is an option. Uh, okay, so one of the things that I read about, uh, which might be um, – Feasible, maybe more feasible for you down there, 
is multi-species grazing rotation. Uh, this in particular slide shows cattle, but um, cattle use their tongue to graze and they don't graze particularly short. Uh, the larvae that are crawling up the grass, they only crawl about five centimeters. So um, it, it also mentioned grazing with horses. Now horses, I think, are going to be, would be really effective if you can graze your field or pasture, let your horses graze it, and um, the larva that they eat from the goats doesn't hurt them because they're not going to um, be affected by, they're not, they don't get those worms. Um, and then um, after, I think, 60 days, then you can put the goats back in and, and it should be relatively parasite free. I thought that was uh, uh, quite a unique and uh, interesting thing. Um, some people also use hogs for uh, the multi-species grazing rotation. So if that's something that interests you, uh, that's something you could look into further, but it is um, a proven technique and apparently it is effective. And so that I found when I was looking, um, the Lespedeza is a plant that has quite a bit of natural tannin in it. I think that's what some of your Sandy, can you repeat that? Can you, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. We keep we keep losing your audio. Okay. Oh darn. Here we go. Okay. So the Lespedeza is the kind of plant that um, contains a natural amount of tannin, T A N I N, which is a natural anthelmintic. And so if you're considering doing a pasture Sandy, we lost your audio. Uh, I think the efficacy rate was about 80% for controlling worms. So I think that is great. You can buy Lespedeza pellets but they're really hard to find. They're out of stock a lot, but that is an alternative. So something that you might research on your own. Um, and another thing that I found was um, a recommendation to plant sorghum uh, Sudan grass. I think that probably would work better in Texas than it would in Michigan. At the goats are uh, browsers and they're going to eat higher. Now, the goats in this picture really aren't. But uh, like I said, the, the larvae only climb like five centimeters up the leaf. So if the goats are eating at the top of this taller grass, um, then they're not going to be consuming the larva. So uh, I thought that was a kind of a, a neat idea. Uh, rotational grazing, this was news to me, I'm going to admit. Um, ideally, you would have four different pastures or fields, and you would graze one of them while the other three remain empty, and then you rotate uh, every 60 days, I want to say. I'm going to look at my notes to make sure I'm saying that right. But, but while you're grazing in the first field, the other fields are empty. So then when you go to the second field, the first field is empty until you get your cycle all the way back. I, it is 30 days. Okay, so you would be in field one for 30 days, and then two, and then three, and then four. 
basically by the time you get to field back to field one, you, they uh, most of the larva should be um, killed off. Uh, I know that people do use this um, electric netting um, to make pastures that they can rotate. Uh, it just depends on your situation, what you have, you know, what you can use. But um, I thought this was interesting because I just built two big pastures and now I'm thinking I might have to divide them into four. Uh, dry lotting is a um, effective way of controlling parasites. In this picture, I do see some vegetation along the fence line, so it's not really a true dry lot. But if you have a dry lot with no plants, the larvae don't have anywhere to climb up, and so you essentially don't have a parasite problem. And I have to do that with some of my bucks, and that's something... I'll mention, and is that for some reason bucks seem to be uh, have more of a problem with parasites, especially barber pole, than do does. I can't find anywhere that it's documented, but we are doing um, 50 to 100 samples a day, and you can see it time and time again. Everybody's having trouble with their bucks more than their does. And the same thing has happened here. So uh, that's something to be cognizant of. Uh, you might need to uh, keep a closer eye on your bucks because I don't know if they don't have as good of an immune response or what the, uh, if it's hormonal or what. Andy, can you repeat that, please? Option is uh, the bioworma is a feed through fungal spore. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. I hear you better now. Okay, good. Um, you can get bioworma by itself, or you can get it in. Um, a feed supplement that's called, I'm not sure if it's pronounced Livamol or Livamol, but anyway, I have used this. Um, I can attest to the fact that it does work, except I made the mistake of letting my does get into my buck pasture. My bucks were on this, and so it kind of negated uh, the benefits because my does were not on it. Um, I have my bucks on it because I can't rotate their pasture. Uh, so sometimes it's a kind of good for a smaller group. Um, I There is a bit of a mm, palatability issue at first. Uh, it took mine five or six days before they would eat it. Um, I have the live them all with bioworma. The bioworma itself, the dose is teeny tiny. Can you see this? For 50 pounds, it's 0 0.05 ounces. Um, it almost seems like if you if you sneeze, it might blow away. But uh, there, you know, so there has to be a way of mixing that in with your feed so that you're not going to lose the dose. I have um, a question, Sandy. Yes. Uh, on this bioworma. Um, is it like, do you have to be very precise with the amount for the, for the body weight? I mean, what is the risk of overdosing the goat with this? I don't, there should be no risk in overdosing the goat. Um, the uh, spores are inert. Uh, they just pass right on through the goat. And <clears throat> the way that they work is then they're in the feces and they start to and they consume the worm larvae that are hatching uh, in the same feces. So um, last year it wasn't available. It is a product that they have to actually agriculturally grow. And for whatever reason, uh, they couldn't get it last year. 
So it wasn't available last year, but it is available again. Well, I do plan to use it for my bucks again. Um, it's just, it's another product that's out there and uh, it's not. But, um, you know, the health back. We lost your audio there. Can you repeat that, please? A nice thing to have in your toolbox, I think. Uh, also, I did know in my research on this is you should not use it with medicated feed. I don't know why, but I wanted to make sure to emphasize that since <laughs> it could be a big waste of money if you did. So... Um, did you know that there's actually a, a vaccine for barber pole? I um, I was kind of excited uh, about that. And right now it's only available in uh, Europe, Australia, South Africa. Um, but it's been available since 2014. So it doesn't sound like it's going to be coming to us in the near future. Um, and it's currently it's only labeled for sheep. Um, Studies on goats have given mixed results. Some some of the studies were really good. Some of the studies weren't good at all. I don't know if they have done enough testing on it to ever have it really licensed for goats, but maybe. Um, and you have to give a one cc of it on the first week, and then one week later another cc, and then that causes... Um, the goat to develop uh, an antibody, which when the barber pole then bites the goat, well, I, they don't bite, but when they drink the blood, they get this antibody and it kills them. But they can't um, maintain those antibodies very long. So you have to give one cc every week. And it said you can't really even space those out. It has to be every week through, throughout the grazing season. And the cost is about 90 cents a dose. So I don't know. Uh, I thought it was uh, interesting, but I don't know if it's ever really going to be practical for us as uh, um, miniature goat breeders. But maybe. We can always hope. Um, by knowing your herd um, and, you know, recognizing that they have much less blood volume than a, a, a standard goat. So we really have to keep up on this. And your benefits are going to be, you know, your goats are going to do better. They're going to have better growth rates, um, probably going to produce better. Um, both with kids and milk, um, should lower your vet costs. We could all use that. Uh, and definitely. There we go. We can hear you now. We lost you. I know. It's all the all right. storms moving across the country, it seems like. All right. So we had some questions here. Let me go up. Let's see here. Um, Destiny. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I thought you were done. Oh, just you want to have that parasite program available to you based on your own animals, your own farm, your own um, situation. And uh, you want to identify drug resistance if you can. And uh, there's different tools for pasture resources. So, um, that you can help to use uh, to reduce parasites. And uh, you might be able to use copper wire particles, um, some of the natural herbals, and some of the other products that we talked about. Uh, put all those things together and you can really make a nice robust plan 
uh, that should really help your herd. All right. Well, uh, are you ready to answer answer some questions, Sandy? Yes. Okay. Well, Destiny Donaldson asked. Um, she says maybe I missed it, but how often are we recommended to do routine routine fecals outside of clear signs of worms? She does once a year minimum, but she's curious um, what's either recommended or what other people do. I, I do random. I do random fecals. Yep. Uh, your Fumacha is going to help answer that question. Um, if your goats all have great Fumachas, then you might not need to, to test. I mean, maybe once a year. Um, but, um, if they all have great Fumachas, great. If they don't, you know, if you've got a bunch of bad ones, then you need to, to do testing and then, treat however way that whatever method that you're going to use you treat and then you need to repeat the fecal to find out if it was effective and if it was great and then if it wasn't then okay now what do we go to next um and sometimes it's next and next and next believe me i've seen that um but uh so Again, it's kind of like your own unique situation. Um, if you that's why I started this business to give a, a low cost option and try to help people uh, to be able to manage their goats for not charging them an arm and a leg so uh. so um cassandra asked and and i do what cassandra does what she what she, the question she's asking she says in her uh, experience her knowledge for heavy infestation she does uh, you would need to reworm every seven to ten days for two to three times to catch the new eggs that hatch because the warmers the dewormers only hit the last stages and she wants to know if that is correct I personally don't do that. I know that there's a lot of um, uh, philosophy that does do it. Um, so I, I wouldn't discount it, but I haven't found in my herd that it's necessary to do that. Okay. Um, Carrie wants to know if there are good, reputable resources for us to access to learn more about parasites. Uh, some of the colleges do have intro yeah. to parasitology classes. Yeah, they do. Um, uh, Ohio State has a good um, program, Purdue. Um, I'm talking about uh, you can go there and you can get, um, you can read, you can learn. They have uh, resources for you available to read and learn. Um, about all kinds of different subjects. The Wormex, um, which is the small consortium for um, animal parasitology, uh, that group is, is fantastic. And then it will point you in a, other directions also. Um, but that's, uh, that's really one of our greatest ones. Uh, University of Georgia also, um, has some really good articles. Uh, the consortium is the one that I applied to to become a FAMACHA instructor. Um, let's yeah. see. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. We have some more questions coming in. Okay. Um, let's see. So let me see here. All right. <laughs> Um, Leslie wants to know if you feed bioworm, the bioworma year round to bucks or just during grazing season? For here, only during grazing season. Um, but that's because we have winter. Um, if I was there, I probably would have to feed it year round unless I dry lotted. 
Um, okay, so Michelle asked, not not me, another Michelle. She asked, she says, I have, she prefaces with saying, I have not tried this, but someone told me you can use dish soap such as Dawn to deworm goats. You put it in their water, and she wants to know if you've heard of this. No. I personally would not do that. No, no, no that's uh, yeah, I, I no, that, yeah, I, you know, you can use uh, chewing tobacco out of a pouch too. I've heard that too, and um, no, that oh. would not be a scientific no, I yeah. wouldn't, I wouldn't do that myself. No. Now, someone did ask about um, how you uh, test for lungworms. Use the Behrman apparatus, correct? Yes. Yeah, and that's basically where you float the feces in the solution and the larvae come out of the feces into the solution. Is that correct? Um, yep. Yeah, you actually use a champagne glass. <laughs> and oh, wow. uh, they go down to the bottom of the stem. And then we can retrieve them from there because they want to swim as far away. That's their um, nature. Get as far away as they can from the mothership, shall we say. And uh, and so that's how we find them. Okay. Well, if no one has any more questions, I'm going to turn it back over to Carrie so that we can wrap this up because I know everybody needs to go take care of their babies. And by babies, I mean their goats. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Sandy. Um, this was great, uh, a great topic here. And man, it seems like we could really dive into this further um, I'm really excited that the Texas mini milkers are going to be getting uh, Michelle and maybe uh, some others uh, FAMACHA instructor certified so that we can at future events actually train everyone on the FAMACHA techniques and actually get everyone some cards so they can do it themselves at their own farm. So with that, just want to thank all of our live uh, participants and thank all of our mini dairy goat podcast listeners We'll be getting this out and just apologies uh, for some of the audio troubles that we had, but that is life. So we'll work through it. With that being said, we'll sign off and everyone have a great day. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to the Mini Dairy Goat Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast for our new episodes. Share the podcast, tell all your goat friends about us, rate and review the podcast, and also you can hit us up on our Facebook page, Mini Dairy Goat Podcast, for more information and show notes. Thank you so much and happy goating.